How's it going, guys? We're just gonna wait for some people to show up. Well, I'll take a swig of some water because my mouth is very, very, very dry. Just one sec, guys. So, guys, today I'm going to start off the podcast with a confession of sorts, a little bit of a confession. Um, out of sheer curiosity, <laughs> I decided to go and delve And do a little bit of a deep dive into the very, very interesting world of the people who are known as QAnon. If you guys have heard, you guys have probably heard of the the movement. So, I just want to let you guys know right off the bat that... um, How should I put this? Um, I'll put it to you guys like this. A person, a Jew, who attends Chabad, right? Who is not Chabad, but who attends Chabad, uh, uh, davens in a Chabad minion, prays in a Chabad minion, and uh, at the end of the minion, let's say this Chabad shul that he goes to is a, happens to be a Meshachist shul, you know, where all the guys in the shul, or most of the guys in the shul believe that the Rebbe is Mashiach. And this guy, uh, you know, while the, the, these, these Chabadniks, these Meshachists are, 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 are singing the song. <laughs> guys, I'm saying this with like a big Lahavdio right now, no offense to any Chabadniks. While the, while the Meshachists are singing the song, Yehi, you know, Yehi Adonainu, I'm not going to finish the rest of the song. Uh, this guy, who's not Chabad, is just there. He's not singing the song. He's not, you know, participating in the Kaddish, participating in the Kaddish after the song is sung. He's just there, right? Or maybe he even, like, steps out for a second while they're doing it, depending on his level of, like, discomfort with that, you know, part of the ideology. But, however, by and large, you know, he will learn... Torah with those guys, he will learn Hasidut with those guys, he will learn Kabbalah with those guys, Halacha with those guys, those Meshachist guys, you know, he'll fabring with them, he'll, he'll, you know, go to their house for Shabbos, does that make him a Meshachist? No. Does that even make him Chabad? Most likely not, maybe he's Chabad friendly in general. Uh, Could he be their friend? Yes. But is he a Meshachist? Does he believe the Rebbe is Mashiach? No. So I will just tell you guys, I went a little bit into the, you know, the content of what QAnon post. I will say there are things I agree with. There are things I think are a little bit crazy. Does that make me QAnon? You know, does that make me a Meshachist? No. (laughs) Is this a nuanced discussion? Yes. So what I want to tell you guys, um, with that said, rather, I want to read to you guys uh, a passage from a book called, uh, it was written in 1984 by a KGB defector. It seems like we're all we're doing is talking about these different KGB defectors that warned us. And it, and, and it all happened in that same year, 1984, interestingly enough. And this time around, it wasn't... Um, the guy we know from all those videos, whose name is Yuri Bezmenov, it was another gentleman. His name was Anatoly Golitsyn. And Anatoly Golitsyn was born, and I'll tell you guys when he was born. He was born in, uh, actually in 1926. He was a little, he was a baby during, I guess, shortly after the Communist Revolution. And he wrote two books about the long-term deception strategy of the KGB leadership. Um, He was born in Ukraine. He provided a wide range of intelligence to the CIA on the operations of most uh, most of the lines, departments of the Helsinki and other residences, as well as the KGB methods of recruiting and running agents. He was an honorary commander of the Order of the British Empire, so I guess he was like, he he basically turned. 
and as late as 1984 was an American citizen. So he basically, you know, came to the States and he, he lived and I believe passed away in America. So he says he worked, he worked in the strategic, strategic planning department of the KGB as a rank of major. In 1961, under the name Ivan Klimov, Ivan Klimov, he was assigned to the Soviet embassy in Helsinki as vice counsel at Taché. He defected with his wife and daughter to, see, I'm not going to read you this guy. I was thinking of just giving you this guy's uh, kind of background. Um, just want to read anything important. Okay. So, so he wrote a book in 1984 called New Lies for Old. Um, and he says, wherein he warned about a long-term long -term deception strategy of see seeming retreat from hardline communism designed to lull the West into a false sense of security and finally economically cripple and diplomatically isolate the United States. Um, see, he wrote, the liberalization would be spectacular and impressive. Formal pronouncements might be made about a reduction of the Communist Party's role. Its monopoly would be apparently sent curtailed. So you guys like remember... When the Iron Curtain fell, everybody thought, yay, Iron Curtain fell, everything's done, liberalization, la la la, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we had a gentleman by the, uh, by the name of, uh, his last name was, it starts with a letter S, came along, and here we go again. So he says, an ostensible separation of powers between legislature, executive, and judiciary, judiciary might be introduced. Supreme Soviet would be given greater apparent power, and the president of the Soviet Union Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the dissidents will be amnestied. Those in exile abroad will be allowed to return. And some will take up positions of leadership in government. Um, see, it says, Sakharov might be included in some capacity in the government or allowed to teach abroad. The creative arts and cultural scientific organizations, such as writers, unions, and academy of si academies of science, will become apparently more independent. So basically, he's talking about, like, westernization of supposedly kind of former communist, um, you know, infrastructures, regimes. He says, there will be greater freedom for Soviet citizens to travel. Western and United U unitized nations, observers, would be invited to Soviet, to Soviet Union to witness reforms and actions. So he was talking about, he wrote this in 84. He was talking about already that kind of was happening. And, you know, essentially what ended up happening, but like it happened even kind of on a more significant scale where we basically thought that we defeated the enemy. So now let's take a look at... Um, what he wrote in his book, just read you guys some passages, and when I read this to you guys, you gonna, you guys, what you're gonna see is just stark similarities, stark, stark similarities um, between what was going on then and basically what I want to talk to you guys about today. So it says. In 1921, as the NEP New Economic Policy, to the, uh, which is the economic policy of the government of the Soviet Union from 21 to, 1921 to 1928, representing a temporary retreat from its previous policy of extreme centralization and doctrinaire socialism. So basically, they were trying, like, letting people kind of like do some capitalistic, I guess, maneuvers and things. So if you guys remember, I, I was talking about the movie Heart of a Dog, and in Heart of a Dog, it's set in 1926, where... People were allowed to have their own private property, but there was like, you know, limits and restrictions. So there was a scene where, you know, these people came in and they were harassing this doctor, uh, the committee of the building and stuff like that. So they were like, you can have your apartment, but you don't need six rooms. You need, you can have four rooms or three rooms or two rooms. You know, they're always like reducing the amount of stuff that he had. Okay. The OGPU created uh, inside the Soviet, inside Soviet Russia, a false anti-Soviet organization called the Monarchist Alliance of Central Russia. My friends, does this remind you of anything? It had once been a genuine organization, right, founded by Tsarist generals in Moscow, people who were for the Tsar, and Leningrad, but liquidated by the Soviet Secret Service in 1919 through 1920. Former members of this organization, among them Tsarist generals and members of the old aristocracy, who had come over to the Soviet side nominally led movement. And then, um, you know, I just put my own little notes here. Does this remind you of the so-called Republicans who um, are, you know, governors of certain states or secretaries of certain states? Okay. Their new loyalty to the Soviet regime was not in doubt, for they had betrayed their former friends in the anti-communist underground. 
They were the Tsarist generals Br Brusilov and Z uh, Zayonchkovsky, the Tsarist military attaché in Yug Yugoslavia, General P Potapov, and the Tsarist transport official Yakushov. The most active agent in the trust was a former intelligence officer of the general staff in Tsarist Russia, whose names included Upperput. Agents of the trust traveled abroad and established confidential contact with genuine anti-communist. Uh, sorry, guys. Somebody is calling. Anti-communist immigrant leaders, in order to ostensibly to coordinate activity against the Soviet regime, among important immigrants they met were Boris Savinkov and General Zhangel. Okay, I'll skip this part. These agents confided in their context that the anti-Soviet monarchist movement that they represented was now well established in Soviet Russia, had penetrated into hard, high levels of the army, uh, the secret service, and even the government, and would in time take power and restore the monarchy. They convinced the immigrant leaders that the regime had undergone a radical change. Communism had completely failed, ideology, the ideology was dead, the present leaders had nothing in common with the fanatical revolutionaries of the past, they were nationalists at heart, and their regime was evolving into a moderate national regime and might soon collapse. Um, moderate de Democrats, anybody? Blue Dog Democrats? Uh, even some of the mainstream media, anybody? Fox News, anybody? The NEP... Just one second, guys. You know what? I'm, I don't know how to go mute over here. One sec, guys. I apologize. So, just continuing to you guys, the NEP uh, should be seen as the first important concession on the road to restoring capitalism in Russia. So this is like the new economic policy of the, you know, this uh, allowance of capitalist, um, you know, allowance of capitalist um, policies. Soon political concessions would follow because of this, said the trust agents, any intervention, the trust agents were these pro tsarist guys. Any intervention or gesture of hostility from European powers or the emigre movements would be ill-advised, if not tragic, since it would only unite the Russian people around their government and so extend its survival. The European governments and the emigre leaders should put to st a stop to anti-Soviet terrorist activities um, and change their attitude from hostility towards the Soviet regime to one of passive acceptance. So basically what they're saying is like, you know, stop resisting, right? They should grant diplomatic recognition and increase trade. In this way, they will be a better opportunity to contribute to the evolu evolutionary process. The immigrant leaders should return to Russia to make their contributions. What they were basically saying was like people who fled Russia were afraid of communism. We're saying, come on, you know, like, come back. Like, everything is okay now. You know, we're not go doing these draconian policies. We're going to let you do capitalism. Like, relax. Everything's okay. Naturally, there were doubters among the immigrants, but the prestige of the leaders of the organization, particularly General... Rusilov, like, right, the rhinos, convinced the majority. They accepted at face value the trust, this information, and passed it on to their influential friends in the European intelligence services. So a lot of these people, they had moved to, like, France, England. I had relatives, actually, who were, like, you know, they left uh, Russia, and they went to, like, I had a relative who went to school. It's called a gymnasia, which is, like, a, like a, basically a private school in France. Uh, and in Romania, a lot of these families, you know, a lot of Jewish families... By the time it had been circulated to governments as secret intelligence, it sounded most impressive, and when, as time went on, the same story was confirmed by source after source, and it became secret and reliable. The intelligence services of Europe were committed, and it was unthinkable that they could all be wrong. While the trust was thriving, the OGPU, which is the Soviet, like, or, like, basically, intelligence service, took control, wholly or partially, of two other movements calculated to influence the political climate in support of the new economic policy. Uh, they were the Change of Signposts uh, movement and the Eurasian movement. So these are like non-NGOs, basically. The first was used by a Soviet security service to mislead emigres and intellectuals in Europe into believing that the strength of communist ideology was on the wane and that the Soviet regime was evolving into a more moderate national state. 
Uh, so basically, they were like, they're trying to convince them, like, that, let's say, it, today, like, the globalists are like, okay, everything is fine, you know, that you could, like, we can have globalists. The movement published, with unofficial government assistance, a weekly magazine in Prague and Paris, the change of signposts, and in Berlin, a paper on the eve. It called On the Eve. In 1922, at some risk, the government, Soviet government, allowed two magazines to be published in Leningrad and Moscow, New Russia and Russia. Interesting. <laughs> uh, they were intended to exert a similar influence on intellectuals inside the country. My friends, uh, I think today we can call those things uh, Facebook and Twitter. Could be. Okay. Uh, by 1926, all publications of the Change of Signpost movement have been wound up. The movement disbanded and some of its leaders in the Soviet Union arrested. An official Soviet publication partially confirms the exploitation of the movement and describes its end. Shortly after, Operation Trust was terminated with the arrest of those opponents of the regime who had been unwise enough to reveal themselves as such by associating with the Trust. To impress the Soviet people, trials of members of the opposition some genuine, some false, were held throughout the country. Does any of this sound familiar to my friends who are watching right now? The NEP, the New Economic Policy, was officially ended by Stalin, Joseph Stalin, a.k.a. Joseph Jugashvili from Georgia, in 1929 with what was called a socialist offensive on all fronts. The concession to foreign industrials were canceled, Private enterprise in the Soviet Union was prohibited, prohibited, private property was confiscated, agriculture was collectivized, repression of political opposition was intensified. <coughs> See Twitter. The new economic policy might have never been. So, my friends, I will just tell you that upon perusing the Q movement and being kind of this, uh, you know, guy who davens with Meshechis, let's put it that way, I've come to realize that a lot of people who are, you know, aligned with this kind of loosely, loose confederation of people on the internet primarily, um, are genuine. But what the mainstream media today have been very adept at doing, or have what have they done they have done successfully is they have taken these people they have turned it into a boogie man and what they've done is they have basically what essentially what I've said have said is if you daven in a meshahist minion you're a meshahist and you should be uh, thrown out of all of Judaism if you vote for Trump you must be associated with QAnon and therefore you must be punished you have to be arrested, you have to be, you know, your, your Harvard degree should be taken away, like we saw a report uh, a couple of days ago. They want to take away people's, uh, you know, alumni's, um, alumni's uh, degrees. These people should be shunned. They, ladies and gentlemen, they want to either shun 75 million people, or they want to somehow, as they have put it, reprogram. How do we reprogram these people? My friends, I'm telling you, this is a one-for-one one Soviet tactic. This is a one-for-one one Soviet tactic. In this particular case, they, they turned Q, or they turned, uh, you know, what, what would, it, would have been the monarchist alliance of Central Russia into a, basically a boogeyman, if not infiltrated. And what they've done is they've taken the regular person who goes to, to a Meshachist minion and have said, oh, by the way, you're also Meshachist. Uh, no, we just daven with Meshachists, we forbring with them, maybe, we maybe agree with uh, Chabad, I don't know, with like what we read in the Tanya or something like that, in Kabbalah or Hasidut, or we, or we learn Halacha, but that doesn't mean that we are Meshachists, it doesn't mean that we are QAnon. This world is nuanced, which leads me to my main point, my friends, it is impossible to talk to leftists because they don't live in a nuanced world. It seems like they do, they claim they do, and they claim that others don't, but to them, everything is basically, as I mentioned to you guys yesterday, it's basically a zero-sum game. If there's an issue that they are, um, you know, pushing 
or that they care about and you tell come up to a leftist and you tell them hey well you know i agree with this part of what you're saying but i don't agree with this part of what you're saying and here is why i'm going to now prove it to you they will call you a hater they will call you a phobe ex phobe like a fill in the blank phobe of this and they will cancel you you know and it started out with cancellations it started out just starts out just on you know social media alone and then it just moves into actually physically canceling you my friends um we're going to have an inauguration probably on wednesday i don't know let's assume we will and um there's thirty thousand troops there protecting people or protecting the the inauguration from this boogeyman called QAnon. and apparently apparently there are a bunch of people that they're afraid of there's a bunch of people that supposedly going to get together in all the state capitals with guns and there's this boogeyman and uh, you know and apparently all trump supporters are regular folks regular people who have told me personally many people that hey i don't even like trump personally but i just happen to agree with some of his policies more so than i agree with democrats or biden or whoever's policies therefore i vote for him nothing to do with QAnon. those people are to be shunned and reprogrammed and deprogrammed and canceled and not spoken to and they're and apparently their kids are supposed to rat on them right to authorities or who or the mainstream media i don't know my friends this is welcome to i'm going to say it in russian then i'll translate for you guys welcome to vanyuchi savok shitty pardon my french smelly stinking soviet union this is it my friends we are on the precipice of it we're not there yet we're on the precipice of it and i'll tell you guys what these idiots don't understand these uh schmucks on uh on you know the ones that run the social media platforms including the one i'm speaking on now mr mark what you don't really understand you don't is that you may think that you're doing a virtuous thing right now you may think that you are like uh you know the arbiter of all that is sacred and holy and you're doing uh but you're you're basically doing what uh you know the mexican president obrador called a modern day inquisition you may think you're doing something virtuous, but you don't really understand is that what this will lead to is another Stalin type, right? And that Stalin type is going to come in and he's going to take away even your little platform called Facebook and your friend Jack's platform called Twitter and your friend Sergei Brin, who I think has thrown his brain out the window, former Soviet citizen, his platform called Google, and by extension YouTube, my friends, this will not end well. I'm telling you as a, as a kid, as a child of Soviet dissidents, my parents can tell you from basically the horse's mouth, because they are the horse's mouth, this will not end well. And if you do not want to listen to us, ignore us at your own peril, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you right now, ignore us, at your own peril and for those 10 percent of you or five percent of you former soviet citizens who want to lecture at me and down to me that i don't understand democracy that i like uh what is it um authoritarianism i will just tell you guys um what i recommend to you and i really don't care what you think of what i'm about i'm about to say i'm going to say this in russian first and i'll say it in english а пойдите на а, этот самый на самосвал и найдите ваши мозги. Go to a garbage dump, right? Or a junkyard, and if you have to take the entire day, find your brain and put it back into your head. I don't care how long it takes, guys. Again, first it's going to be us people with the conservative viewpoints and then and then it's going to be you guys it's very 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 simple my friends that's it it's kind of complicated but it's actually quite simple anyway guys oh my friend is writing yup twitter scrub 70,000 q 
related acts, and you knew they gave the thumb drive to the FBI and have at, said have at it. My friends, I mean, you know, history is, is unfortunately a broken record. It's a broken record. Um, and that's the story, my friends. And in two days, we're going to see the beginning of that broken record, assuming, assuming the Q is wrong. Which, who knows, you know, because a lot of people on Q have been saying, and just in general have been saying, you know, maybe this is, uh, Trump is waiting uh, to do something, and we're going to have all kinds of power outages, and this and that, I'm not even going to go into it. There's a lot of things spinning around, we don't know what's going to be, but assuming everything goes according to normalcy, or is what the Soviet regime called normalization, once they rolled their tanks into Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, into Prague, my friends... Welcome, welcome. And uh, that's basically it, my friends. So, at this point, you guys may be saying, well, you're telling all, all this stuff to me, like, what are we supposed to do about this? Well, awareness is a good thing. It's good to be aware, you know, of where you're at. You know, not sleeping is also a good thing. Not being a sheep is also another fantastic thing. Uh, knowing what to do in the event of th things getting hairy is also a good thing. So yeah, that's basically it, guys. That is basically it. All right, anyway, any other questions? Feel free to comment. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. All right, guys. Former Soviet citizen, son of dissidents, signing off. And uh, like I said, if you don't agree with me, if you don't believe me, do not come crying to me and others like me when stuff hits the fan. Good day to you.